Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. I am so glad that you are here. Unfortunately, as I sat down to record this episode, my ring light blew, and I quickly placed an overnight order for a new ring light, but that is why there is going to be no video, only audio for this particular episode, which I'm assuming is okay with you guys, since I know a lot of you guys listen to this stuff uh, driving or doing housework. But for those of you who do enjoy seeing my facial expressions and reactions to this channeled work, I do apologize that this episode will again have to be a podcast. The real crappy thing is, as luck would have it, um, I got up and did my hair and put my makeup on. So now I'm sitting here talking into a microphone, into a camera, with full hair and makeup without the camera turned on because not having the ring light, it, it just looks awful. There's It's too dark. It's too shadowy. So I do apologize. Anyway, um, we, of course, are reading from the great human potential, walking in one's own light, teachings from the Palladians and the Hathors by Tom Kenyon and Wendy Kennedy. And this, of course, we're in the section of the Palladian channeling, which I'm assuming is from Wendy Kent. Kennedy, because the next section is going to be the half fours, which we know are Tom Kenyon's group. Now, if you're new to this channel, um, I will be putting the playlist Understanding the Magdalene down in the description box below. We have gone through all of Tom Kenyon's other works, and I believe this is the last one that he has that we have to, to go through. If you guys know of any other Tom Kenyon books that we haven't gone through, let me know, and I will definitely look into getting them. Um, so anyway, this is part two of the uh, chapter we started last week, which is Conversations with the Ninth Dimensional Palladians, the Universal Game post-2012. Again, last well, I divided this chapter up into two sections because it is such a long chapter. So on top of having the playlist down in the description box below, I will also have part one down in the description box below so you can watch that first if you are new to this channel. So we're going to be starting on page 86, which is Judgment versus Forgiveness. Now, I have not, as you guys know, I don't read ahead. I, I, I try to give a very real and raw reaction to this work as I am reading it into the camera. When I do deep dives into old um, scripture, like the missing books of the Bible or anything like that, I typically do read ahead and do a lot of research. But with these channeled books, all the channeled books, which are in the playlist Understanding the Magdalene, I, I really like to give you guys an honest perspective from me um, so that maybe I'm hitting on some things that also you hit on as well. And we can kind of talk about it together. Obviously, I love it when you guys leave your comments in the comment section about this work because we're all just going through this together. Now, again, because I have not read ahead i'm just looking at the title which is judgment versus forgiveness and i want to make it clear maybe, maybe the palladians will get into this not all judgment is bad there are so many different types of judgments yeah so i want to make that very clear if you're around somebody and you your gut is telling you that you don't like that person that is not bad judgment that is your intuition Right? I think sometimes we gaslight ourselves into not trusting our gut because we we forget that judgment has many judgment itself is very complex. Now, to judge somebody of a crime that you have no evidence they committed will probably build up some negative karma for you. But when if you don't feel good around somebody, you can quietly just walk away, right? It's like, you know, for, for females, for myself, it's like when you're walking down the street at night and something inside of you, you, you see a shadow of somebody walking beside you and you're, you're are behind you. Your gut tells you cross the street, right? That's You're judging that shadow as, as being potentially harmful, but there's an intuition that's keeping you alive if that makes sense. So I want us to be very careful with this concept of judgment. Yeah? Not all judgment is bad. Some of it is bad. Some of it is our own shitty stuff that we've got to work through, but not all of it is bad. All right? There is a survival, and I think most people have the wisdom 
and enough discernment to know the difference between the two. Okay, anyway, so here we go, page 86, Judgment versus Forgiveness. All right, so the first paragraph is obviously Wendy Kennedy asking the Palladians a question. So here's Wendy Kennedy, the channeler. Elimination of judgment and forgiveness are two ways of letting go. But from what I understand, forgiveness is not quite the same thing as no judgment. When you forgive, you can still have judgment about a situation. It can help you get out of anger or deception and go forward, but it can still include judgment. Many times we hear people say, I can forgive, but I will never forget. Is forgiveness the first step towards no judgment, or it is a completely different energy? The Palladians answer her. You are currently operating under the universal laws of attraction and reflection. As part of the construct of the 3D game, you knew that it would be difficult from the perception of limitations to see and recognize frequency within yourself. So the universal laws of attraction and reflection were put into place. Your reality and all that you perceived in it is a reflection of your own vibrational frequency. Most of the time that is correct. Most of the time. It, however, according to the Cassiopeians, according to the Law of One, if you are a wanderer, there are going to be times when people come into your life who are hell-bent on destroying you, and it has nothing to do with your karma. It has nothing to do with your the, the things you came here to refine. It is simply about the fact that you are a wanderer. And if you don't know what that is, I would highly recommend that you check out my Amazon affiliate link, which is down in the description box below. If you click on the category books used on the show, you will see both the Cassiopeian first volume as well, well as the Law of One first volume, which can give you more insight into what that is. You are creating and generating 100% of your reality 100% of the times, not just sun, not all the time, at all levels, and what we label as good or, good or bad. Neither really exists as such. They are simply vibrational experiences, again, unless you are a wanderer. That is the, there, you know, that's one thing that kind of we need to, I think, as a greater community, talk about this idea of, of black and white thinking. Black and white thinking are things that, cults use their mind control tactics to paint something black or something white it's all in or it's all out when you're an empathic person when you're a person with complex thinking skills you typically understand that most of life and most of life's circumstances reside in shades of gray and so by them saying that this is 100% of the truth all the time, no exceptions, that's a little scary to me that they said that because that is black and white thinking and that's dangerous. It is, And that's the reason why I always say like, let's look at the wanderer percep perception as well because wanderers have a lot of stuff happen to them that is not their fault and they don't know that they're wanderers and they don't know that's why that's happening. If we look back at the Emerald Tablets and what Thoth said, he talked about how in spirit form, so these entities or beings that are in the unseen world that we can't see don't necessarily see us in our physical 3D bodies and the, 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 the nature that we're in right now. So the body, they don't see that. What they see is your shade of light. And wanderers will have a particular hue, a particular shade of light, light that marks them as a wanderer. Even if the um, person in the avatar doesn't remember that that's what they are. The darkness can not see that. And just by the wanderer holding that vibrational frequency, the dark side, the polarized side, the 4D negative wants to take that wanderer out. It has nothing to do with any of the wanderer's karma. So if you're dealing with someone, now most of the time, majority of the time, stuff that happens to you, people that come into your life are a reflection of things you need to work on, are a, a reflection of where you are. But when big things happen that have nothing to do with that and it's come to derail you and to try to take you out, that might be indication that you're a wanderer, right? And so I, I just wanted to put that out there. I, I don't like that paragraph. That really bothers me. This whole black and white thinking is not okay. It's not okay. The us versus them, it's all or none. 
Um, I wish I could just remove that. I, I can't believe the Palladians actually said that. But I will say in a lot of cases, as we've said before with some of this channeled work, when you are channeling from the unseen world, when you're getting that information, you're filtering it through the perception of your own reality. And every channeler does this, whether they're channeling through a spirit board or tarot cards or whatever it may be. Every channeler is filtering the information given to them, again, through the perceptions of their own reality. We do this as as, as non, or I don't say we, because I know I have that ability as well, but people, humans on this, this, this reality, we do the same thing, right? We have a saying where it's, it, there's no such thing as reality. It is all perception. So if someone were to give me information about something, and then that someone were to give somebody else the same information, my perception of that information is obviously going to be different than the other person who got the information. There might be similarities, but there's going to be some slight differences because we are all living through our, our own our own perception, our own experiences. And so we have to be very careful when reading any type of channeled material to take things with a grain of salt. And Tom Kenyon does say that a lot in many of his books, that what doesn't resonate with you, leave it to the side, right? So Tom Kenyon is very open about this. That there could be, you know, we, we, we have to leave room for lost in translation. We have to leave room for the mistakes made by the channeler subconsciously placing their own perception on information given to them by somebody else. And so this could potentially be something coming from Wendy Kennedy and not necessarily the Palladium. So that's all I have to say about that. Let's go ahead and move on. Anytime you perceive yourself as a predator or a victim, you are perceiving reality through the operating system of the mind. The mind was created as a, a construct that allows for the perception of limitation, separation, and linear time. In other words, it is where you run your ego programs or filter that color of your perception of reality. I just, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I was just saying, but in the sense of victim predator, I actually very much take um, offense to that and very much disagree because if we look at something just, if we take spirituality out of it, we just look at something like narcissistic abuse. A lot of us have been through narcissistic abuse. We all know what that is. A lot of times what narcissists do is they gaslight their victims. They make their victims feel like the reality that they're seeing doesn't exist. Gaslighting can cause a lot of mental um, despair and a lot of, of trauma for the victim. And so sometimes I think when we jump to this victim predator labeling, we're causing more trauma to the person working through whatever it is they're working through. You can be the victim of something without behaving like a victim. Two things get to be true here, right? You can be the victim of a horrific crime, but also move forward in your life by working through your experiences with the trauma of that crime through whatever means therapy, um, holistic healing, whatever means you, you choose to take. So in that situation, when you're the, the victim of a crime and you decide, you make the decision that you're not going to let the trauma control you anymore, and so you're going to go work on it with a specialist, you're not really the victim anymore, even though you are, if that makes sense. Two things get to be true again. So if you have somebody coming to a therapist who has been massively abused or had something happen to them where they were absolutely not at fault. And you are telling them, well, this perception of you being a victim is just your ego. You are causing more harm to the person than you are doing good. If we are people who are of the light and we are working in service to others, then that means we need to help people in ways that are going to actually help them. Yes, we have to be as, as holistic healers or teachers there has to be a strictness. Absolutely. In the Mysore room where I teach, there has to be a strictness, right? Because your job is to keep somebody on, on the path and not let them get distracted. But there also has to be a softness where there is compassion. And telling somebody that they aren't a victim when they were a victim is extremely damaging to that person. And so I, I, anyway, let's keep going and hear what they have to say. The heart is the operating system for the multidimensional self in which you run 
none of your ego programs or filters and can perceive and understand the true nature of reality as a universal being of light generating a human experience. At this level, you are aware that there is no time. You are connected to everyone and everything and your experiences are co-created by you, another consciousness and source. This is the true nature of your holy trinity. All things in form hold consciousness so co-creation can occur with nature, animals or other beings. In a dualistic universe of which you are a part, there must be a polar opposite to each experience. That is true. The law of one does talk about that. In other words, you must have a perpetrator for each victim. Ah, we already hear some of you asking if the universe is dualistic, does that mean you have victims and predators in ninth, ninth density? No, we choose to play our polarity out in other ways. And that is true. Um, the the uh, Cassiopeians and the law of one talk about this. So again, third density the density that we're in right now is the density of choice. That's that's the point, is that we make choices. So in order to make choices, we have to have friction. In order to have friction, you have to have opposing forces. So you have the dark and the light, the good and the bad, God, Lucifer, whatever you want to call it. Those are just vocabulary words for the same thing. In order for you to have a deeper, complex understanding of your karmic responses to situations. And every dimension is very different. So fourth density, after third density, it splits. It either goes fourth density positive or fourth density negative, right? Um, and I don't know what, what that, because in fourth density positive, that's the love uh, vibration. Then you get to fifth density, which I believe is wisdom. So every density has a different purpose. So that is true what they said. Different dimensions have different constructs. From the fifth dimensional level up, we do not perceive ourselves as being separate from anyone or anything. So we know we co-create and operate within our basic premise. We may not always agree, but we do know reality is of our own making. Now, I will be, I, I also want to say something too, and I've, I've talked about this off and on. I believe I kind of touched on it last week too. Right now, we have this weird phenomenon that I like to call popcorn spirituality. And it is one of the most terrifying things that I have witnessed. And I think a lot of this is coming from this overall kind of wokeness that we're seeing in the world where there's this entitlement. You know, like people aren't willing to go back to the basics. They have to, all of a sudden they decide they want to do something. And so without taking the, the, the steps necessary to understand the subject in which they want to do, they jump all the way up to, to calling themselves an expert. And that's not the case. That's why we have a lot of people abusing past lives, which again, I said many times that past lives aren't, aren't necessary. That's just a trick of the ego, right? What's, what's necessary is understanding the here now. That's what spirituality is about. Spirituality is about being here now, not there then. How are you handling a situation in the here and now, right? And people get triggered by me saying this, but that's if you're triggered, that's your ego. Because your, your, your soul and your, your soul knows what I'm, there's truth to what I'm saying. Your ego, however, does not. And I think why people get stuck in this trap, because they haven't yet to understand the foundation, another foundation of spirituality, where your body, your avatar, is not your soul. And so you confuse the story of you, of your lives, your past lives. You confuse that for something that's totally different. It, it would be like basing all of your self-worth on the clothes you wear. That's silly. So a lot of people get really addicted to past lives because they have yet to understand the fundamental truth that you're not your past lives. You're not this life. This is just an experience. The nervous system, the emotional body is here to give you resistance for you to refine your soul. It's like when you go to the gym and you lift weights. Lifting weights is resistance training. Being in a body is resistance training. But let's say you go to the gym and you run on the treadmill and then you get off the tra treadmill and you go and lift weights. When you're experiencing the burn of the weights, you're not gonna try to work with that burn, that resistance from the weights by resorting back to the treadmill you were just on. The burn might have been intensified because you already got your blood moving, your heart pumping from the treadmill that you were just on, but you're not on the treadmill right now. You're lifting a weight, a dumbbell. And so to ignore the fact that you're lifting the dumbbell and go back to the treadmill and try to, to work through that burn by, by reminiscing about your time on the treadmill is not going to do anything but make you crazy. Yeah? 
It's crazy making. You need to be here now, in the moment now, because you are not either of these things. They are merely resistance training. You are not the dumbbell. You are not the treadmill. You are the person experiencing this. You are not this life. You are not your past lives. You are the soul that is experiencing it. Right now, I am in the avatar of Bryce. That is the that is what my soul picked to experience this life. I cannot solve any of my problems by going back to a past life that I don't even have full memory of. That's just going to cause more, more, more confusion. That's going to force me to get stuck even more into my ego, even more into the illusionary world. A lot of times people become addicted to past lives because they're trying to escape this one. There's a great show, and I can't remember what it's called. It's here in the United States. It's this homicide detective and a psychic medium who go across the United States to severely haunted houses. And the homicide detective does the literal research into the history of the house while the psychic does the walkthrough and they compare notes at the end. I love this show. It's very entertaining. Well, there was one scene where they were at this like haunted hotel. And the psychic medium picked up on the fact that the matriarch of the family, the mother, was getting really sucked into this hotel and didn't want to sell it and move like the rest of the family because of all the destruction it had caused with the hauntings because of a past life experience. And the psychic medium said something so profound. I think it was one of the most important episodes that they ever released. And I'm trying to like get this point across to everyone because I don't want, I don't want to see anybody, anyone else hurt by these charlatans out there that are selling you that your answers lie within your illusionary world, not in your soul was that, and I'm paraphrasing what she said. If you focus so much on your past lives, it will literally kill you. She sat this woman down and said, this is going to kill you. You've got to let your past lives go. you got to let it go. It will physically kill you to keep doing this. You are not there. You are here. You are not that person you were in that life anymore. That ride is over. Now you are this person. And this is the karma you've been tasked to work through in this life. Not the past one. The past one's done. Any energy or fears or imbalances that you pulled over from a past existence. Yeah, that happens. Absolutely, it does. But you are here now to work through those issues in the perception of who you are now. Not who you were then. I hope that makes sense. I really want people to stop being led astray by these people who don't have the qualifications to be trying to lead you down this path. Please get a teacher. Please, you know, you, you can't read a college thesis until you've learned your ABCs. Learn your ABCs first so that you're not duped and you don't get pulled even deeper into the samskaric loop, the trap. Because the more you get pulled deeper in those past lives, yes, it can kill you. And two, it just means that you are going to have to live up even more karma and more lives. So anyway, all right, let's keep going. If you are still seeing yourself as a victim and you're not taking responsibility for your part of the co-creation, again, I really, this is really bothering me what this is saying because again, if you have a rape victim, right? Now, obviously, yes, there is a karmic lesson in that. I'm not ignoring that. I'm not saying that. But you can't go to that rape victim and say, oh, you're not a victim. You co-created this. That is not going to help their healing. So I'm really taking offense to the way the Pleiadians are saying this. This is not, this is very black and white thinking. And hopefully, I'm hoping it's not the Pleiadians saying this, but maybe Wendy Kennedy's interpretation of what the Pleiadians are saying. All right, let's keep going, though. When you see the service of your co-creations -cre that it teaches you or reminds you, then you are able to move beyond victimization and truly forgive and forget. If you have not forgotten, then you have not forgiven. Ooh, ooh. obviously, these people have never dealt with narcissists. You know, it's easy to, like with a narcissist situation, it's easy to understand why they do what they do. If you study narcissism, it's easy to kind of forgive them 
you know, forgive them, Father, for they do not what they do for what they're doing, but also put a boundary up. Boundaries are very important. Boundaries are a huge spark part of spirituality. If you martyr yourself, you are going 4D negative. Martyrdom is part of the selfish path. Again, law of one, all that information is in the Amazon affiliate link down below if you want to read that into that more. But um, I don't like what they're saying here because this is setting people up to be martyrs. This is setting people up to allow for abusive people to remain in their lives because they feel like they have to forgive them and forget about it. You know, if you're married to a husband that beats the shit out of you every night and the Palladians are telling you that in order to evolve spiritually, you have to not only forgive your husband for beating the shit out of you, but you have to forget about it too. And so every night you're just going to keep getting beat up again, beat up again, and you're going to eventually martyr yourself to this person, this psychotic person. Boundaries are extremely important. There's a great channel on YouTube called HG Tutor. He is a narcissist, a self-aware narcissist, and his channel is phenomenal. And he talks about this. He talks about putting that he's a narcissist himself. And he talks about you got to put boundaries up. Right. So I just even though I'm going to continue reading this, I'm just really having a hard time with this because this is setting people up for uh, for not understanding that they can choose. You can forgive someone. You absolutely can. I disagree with the whole, if you haven't forgotten, then you haven't forgiven. You absolutely can forgive someone, but not forget what they did to you and not let them back in your life. Put that boundary up. Absolutely you can. The two are not mutually exclusive. Two things, again, two things get to be true. You can forgive the, my ex fiance who almost murdered me one night. I have forgiven him for what he did to me, but I haven't forgotten. He's not welcome back in my life anymore, but I've forgiven him. I, I don't hold any animosity towards him. So again, I just want people to consider that because mm, not too happy with this chapter so far. We would say this is true 99% of the time. All right, cool. So they're kind of, they're backpedaling now. So let me start this whole paragraph over again. If you have not forgotten, then you have not forgiven. We would say this is true 99% of the time. We are still referencing a hurt. You perceive yourself as a victim in some way, and you, and you are still going back to that moment in time. If you have forgiven, then you will most likely not think about a scenario unless you encounter the same frequency again and recall past moments when you previously experienced it. And if it's being reflected back to you in your reality, then there is something in your field that you are holding and pulsing out that is creating, generating that reflection. Okay, yeah, yeah, again, I'm just going to, we might actually do this chapter in three parts because I really want to take some time to talk about this because this is not, I just don't, um, agree with them at for this at, at, at all because they're saying what they're saying here is basically if somebody hurt you or something happened to you and you haven't you you say you've forgiven them but you have forgotten that anytime there's a memory that's brought back there's still hurt there that's not true that is not true again i'm going to use my experience as a reference because this is my my own experience is the only one i can really talk about so i from my, through my 20s into my early 30s, had the propensity of dating very abusive men, very narcissistically abusive men. And it culminated to me dating a guy, being with a guy who almost strangled me to death one night. And I recognize at this point at 40 years old, looking back over the 10 years ago to that episode, that I needed that to happen in order to really push me into healing myself. So what do I mean by this? Yes, what he did to me was terrible and wrong and he should not have done that. And yes, I have every right at this moment to put a boundary up and not let him in my life anymore because he almost took my life. However, through my own work with trauma therapy, I've been able to recognize that that incident happened, needed to happen in order for me to understand where I had some wounds from childhood that were not healed. I grew up in a very complex, complicated childhood, uh, grew up in a narcissistic system. 
Um, I am definitely an empath. And my whole life, from as early as I can remember, I have been trying to make other people happy. Because obviously there was some dysregulation in my childhood where I didn't feel comfortable even with my own family, where I felt like I had to just make everyone happy. I remember my mother saying to me a lot, don't rock the boat. You know, don't, because I was the one that was also saying things like, obviously I knew something wasn't right and, and there was abuse happening. I just didn't have the words to say it. And, you know, I, I'm very grateful. There are people who, who have their, these Instagram accounts where they say stuff like, you know, people say, keep the peace. Well, whose peace are, peace are you trying to keep? So my whole life, my, my childhood into my early adulthood was all centered around keeping abusers keeping predators, keeping psychopaths and narcissists happy. That was ever. And so that led me, I expressed that wound of, I was not protected as a child. The, the mental abuse I went through, um, I, I have some missing memories from childhood. I was not protected, you know, and that's sad to, to, to look back from the outside looking in, it would look like I was protected, but I wasn't, I was not protected at all. It was more or less trying to figure out how to deal with predators and keep the predators happy than protecting the child who was being abused. Yeah, it's like that obligation to the predator. That's how it worked in my family. The adults were the ones who needed to be respected. Didn't matter if the child was being abused. And I do feel like at this point in 2023, the good news is that we are more aware of the levels of abuse that happen to children. Um, I feel like for me specifically that I grew up in a narcissistic system um, with my school. I went to a private school and I think a lot of private schools are cults, cults are narcissistic systems. I feel like the town that I lived in was a cult and was a looking back. I, I have huge reactions um, as, as just to be a little bit more vulnerable um, my mother moved back to that town and I've had to process betrayal trauma because once again, that messages to me that I'm not protected, that the loyalty of the people who are supposed to love me unconditionally and want to protect me have always protected the predators over me. And so this is a huge thing that I dealt with my whole life as a child. And so as an adult, in order to receive love, I felt like I had to be walking on eggshells. I had to make sure I was attracted to abusive people because that's how I knew love. The only love I knew as a child was through, was through manipulation and abuse. And any time there was clarity of what was going on and I tried to say something, it was always don't rock the boat. Keep the predator happy. Keep the abuser happy. So that taught me as an adult how I needed to keep abusers happy until one night it almost ended my life. And that was the domino effect that put me in a trauma therapy that put me through massive healing where I didn't even understand that subconsciously that I knew I had a fucked up childhood. Don't get me wrong. I knew it. And now at 40, I can pinpoint every single person in my life who was malignant narcissist. I can go back to the point when I was a child and remember those feelings of being around that person. Again, as I said in the, in the opening of this, there's, there is good judgment. The headmaster of my school, I will say it right now, the headmaster of my school when I was a child, I believe in my opinion, I've got clarity is a malignant narcissist. Because even as a little girl, his daughter and I were really good friends. I love his daughter to death. But even as a little girl, when I'd be playing over at her house, when he would come on, I come home, I would get scared. He scared me. I never wanted to be around him. I always got nervous. Even to this day, I think if I were to pass him in the grocery store, even though he's an old man now, I would probably get scared. Now, looking back at that, I understand why. Because that little girl felt in her gut that there was something wrong. And I know now that I'm a highly empathic person. And so what do narcissists do? Empathic people are light bearers. Narcissists are light feeders. They feed off of that person and it turns into manipulation and abuse. And so, you know, anyway, so I, I know I'm rambling on a bit, but hopefully in sharing this story, it will help somebody or help 
help somebody listening right now not to feel like you're crazy or not to feel like you're alone um, and, and, and help you seek the healing that you deserve. You deserve to be healed. You, you deserve to work through that karma. It is karma. And so what the, what the Pleiadians are saying here to me is extremely dangerous, right? It's extremely dangerous. They're playing a dangerous game because it is not true. I understand for some people that could be true, that you could offer forgiveness, but not forget. And in not forgetting, you're still carrying hurt and pain. But in, in other instances, that's not, that's not true. I have absolutely forgiven the person who almost killed me. I have no, I'm very neutralized in my feelings towards him. I don't, I'm, I don't really care. I'm kind of just like, eh, whatever happens to him, happens to him. I've, I've, for, and I'm, I'm actually in a lot of ways, this might sound a little, <laughs> little fucked up, but I'm actually kind of grateful what happened to me because that pushed me down a healing path that I might not have been aware of to go on until it was necessary to go on it. And so in some ways, I'm kind of grateful that that happened, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to forget it. And it doesn't mean that I don't want that person in my life. I don't wish any ill will on him, but I don't want him in my life. And so that's not true. I just, I just want, I really just don't feel comfortable with what they're saying. And it's very dangerous. And, and anyway, so, all right, let's keep going. If you have more questions about that, you guys, if you want me to do a more detailed episode about the complexities of healing and the complexities of trauma and karma and spirituality and what it all means, leave me a comment in the description box below and I can maybe uh, create a panel of people to kind of discuss these topics, which hopefully, hopefully give more clarity to people and hopefully, you know, you're not putting yourself in a position. And that's the, that's the scary thing about the spirituality nowadays. Like I think people think in order to be spiritual, then you got you you have to be self-sacrificing. We we learn this through religion, but that's a narcissistic <laughs> we learn this through our just our cultural and culture in general. But that's a narcissistic thing, right? Like to be self-sacrificing to someone else. That's not love, you guys. I knew that I had healed that trauma after trauma therapy when I started to attract men into my life who were kind, who were good. You know, I, I, the relationship that I'm in now, this is like the first relationship I've ever been in where there's no cheating. And I trust him 100%. Like, I know he's not good. He's not that way. Because I healed the wound. So now I'm attracting, I attracted somebody who matched my vibrational healing, not somebody who was trying to magnify a wound that needed to be healed within me. Hope that makes sense. All right. We will also say this to you. Anytime you are not in the present moment, you are still operating. You are still in the operating system of the mind, which again, this means you are perceiving things from a fear-based limited persp perspective. I do believe you need to be in the moment. Again, be here now, not there then. But again, that that's not true. If you, again, with my situation with my ex, even though I've forgiven him, I haven't forgotten it, but I don't think about it every day. It's not like I'm in the operating system of fear because I'm afraid of him. He's a coward. Even though he almost killed me, he almost killed me when we were at home by ourselves. He wouldn't do anything to me on the street. Right? Like, I'm not afraid of him. I'm not afraid of the situation. I don't even think about him most of the time. But I'm saying that I haven't forgotten what happened. It, it, that was That's information that I need in order to understand the boundaries that need to be put up. Yeah, so I just want us to be very careful with this information. If you are fully engaged with the present now moment, it is impossible to re reference the past. Not necessarily true again. Because I can be fully engaged in the now moment without thinking about the past, but still carry the information from the past in order to keep me safe and moving forward in the here now moment. But again, that's like the past life thing. You can carry in your DNA in your psyche, the information from those past existence without being there, without being, without focusing on it. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense what I'm saying. The moment you disengage from the now, you are moving out of an operating system of the heart and are back in the operating system of the mind. We can see many of you don't really like this answer, but it is the true nature of things. Again, there's that black and white thinking, which is not helpful. It's everything's shades of gray. 
It feels more comfortable and safe to go back to the illusion of the mind where you take only partial or no responsibility. Again, that is black and white thinking and that is scary what they're saying. That is a terrifying thing. So yes, real forgiveness means no judgment, period. Absolutely not correct. Um, Seeing that period explanation point as it's written just makes me mad because again, that is black and white. That's absolutely black and white thinking and that is not correct. If you are still judging it anyway, you haven't truly forgiven, that is manipulation. That line right there, if you are still judging it anyway, you haven't truly forgiven, that is manipulation, you guys. That sentence is manipulation. Can you imagine if you are with someone and they did something shitty to you a long time ago and you forgave them and then months later you're noticing the same patterns and you say something like, well, you, you're still judging me. So you haven't really forgiven me. All of a sudden you become the predator G guys. That's manipulation. So in this, I feel like this is a very manipulative chapter. We're going to finish it, but I just want to tell you there are a lot of red flags in this chapter. And this is why it's so important to always take these things with a grain of salt. And this is why it's so important to, we only look at channel material once a week on this channel and we do it just because it's interesting. Some of it, I agree with it. A lot of it in the past I have agreed with, but there are some parts where I don't agree with it. And I think it's dangerous. And, um, you know, of course, the person writing this book would be like, oh, you're judging the book because you think it's dangerous. No, my friends, not all judgment is bad. I think this is dangerous. I think what they're telling you here is very dangerous. And so I'm going to say something. Right? doesn't mean that I'm giving them bad judgment. It doesn't mean that I'm projecting anything onto them. It just means that I see some red flags here. And so I'm going to say something. I'm going to put some boundaries up with this. Okay? So if, if you are with somebody in your life that is spewing this to you, manipulating you and manipulating your feelings to make you feel like you're the bad guy for having questions or concerns then I would have questions and concerns about that relationship. The truth, you guys, the truth can stand up to judgment. The truth can stand up to criticism. The truth can be put on trial. A lie cannot. A lie cannot set up, stand up to, to criticism. A lie cannot stand up to judgment. And so I would just, um, if anybody's talking to you this way, then they're trying to hide something. Just be careful. And I think we're actually going to do three parts because I know I've gone on a long time. So when we get to the next question here. We're going to pause it and pick it up back uh, next week with part three because this is some heavy stuff. As with any fear, you may choose to process it in levels, levels and layers. For most of you to bring up all the perceived pain and the fear would leave you in a heap on the floor. So you will only reveal to yourself as much as prepared to process. And how do you process? When you have the awareness that you are still harboring Ill, Ill feelings, check in with yourself and see what is going on at the physical, mental, and emotional level. Does your body go into contraction? If so, what is the thought or emotion that signals the body to do so? What is going on at the mental level? What are your thoughts? Perhaps the mind says, you fool, you can't forgive. You are gullible and naive if you do that. How are you feeling emotional, insecure, fearful? If you are feeling anything but total peace at all levels with an issue or an experience, then there is more judgment to be released or integrated. You must move into the heart center to do this. It is impossible to release from the level of the mind. It is possible that you may have forgiven at the mental level, but you haven't dealt with the emotional component or vice versa. Again, all levels must be addressed to fully release the judgment. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Um, just be careful with this information, guys. Just be very, very careful. I will say, too, you know, I, I was sharing with my friends the other day about some of my experiences um, in trauma therapy, actually, because I was kind of telling her like what it's like and things that had happened and stuff that we do every day that we're not aware of the uh, things that we do that are informed by our trauma, by our past that we're not even aware. That's where that comes from. And uh, after the first few sessions with my therapist, she said something, she said that I was showing a lot of signs of somebody who had experienced extreme sexual abuse as a child extreme molestation and she's not the first doctor the first person to say this to me i had some pediatricians when i was a child i will never forget 
saying something to my mother in the room that I looked like I had suffered from some abuse. And it always got swept under the table. It was never addressed. It was just kind of left at one point when I was in high school. Um, my uterus, I forgot what it's called. There's a, there's a, um, a medical term for it, but where your uterus starts to fall out. And that was another concern because that typically happens to a teenager or a child when they're being abused sexually. Now, for me, I don't have memory. Um, there's some like little tiny memories, some like gray, foggy memories of something that had happened, but I don't have full memory. And according to my therapist, the the symptoms that I was showing um, meant that this was happening a lot. And my therapist said to me when I said I don't have a, a lot of memory of that, I you know, she said that's okay. So I want I want to say this like you know they're talking about like you know, you're not going to remember everything because you can't process everything. Yes, that's true. But my therapist made a good point in saying, you don't remember everything because that's your body's way of protecting you. And we're not going to try to override your body. We can heal you. We can work on healing your trauma without having to remember everything. And, and she was right. And um, when, when you're dealing with something like that, something heavy. I remember I called my mom afterwards because I was hysterical and what she said made a lot of sense. Like I, it, it resonated with me that that's probably what was happening to me too. Like that was probably part of it. And I just didn't remember. Um, and my mom got very upset. So when you're dealing with a lot of trauma, especially within people, you know, parents or siblings or whatever, your trauma is also going to bleed onto them as well. And I understand that, that for my mother accepting that there was no protection for me, accepting that I had been put in situations where I was not protected and I was abused and um, accepting that as a parent has got to be really hard to do. And so when I, now, now, now that I'm working through all, all the betrayal trauma, which is one of the hardest traumas to work through with my mother moving back to the place that abused me so horribly, um, I have to remember that even though I feel like she knows deep down I was that there was no protection for me, that it's hard for her as a parent to accept that because that's traumatic for her to accept that she allowed as a parent that to happen to her child. And so when they're talking about the not remembering and kind of making light of it, again, this is complex. And you have to remember that your mind is created. Your mind can be your poison but it can also be your protector. And so I would, again, take everything they're saying here with a huge grain of salt. I see this, this part of this book as being very manipulative, extremely manipulative. I don't know who Wendy Kennedy is. She could be a lovely, lovely person, but in reading this and knowing that she's the one channeling, I kind of feel like we're looking at someone that might have a little bit of narcissism, narcissism in them themselves. And therefore, they're kind of weaponizing spirituality in order to justify bad behavior. I don't know. Again, I could be wrong. Just my opinion reading this. But anyway, let's keep going. If you are having difficulty finding forgiveness, then we recommend you take a look at where you are playing out the very same frequency with another person or perhaps in another area of your life. We guarantee you are playing it out in multiple ways. It may look different on the surface, but the, but the base thought, feeling, or emotion is the same. As you integrate or release the judgment of a frequency in one area of your life, you release it in all areas. As an example, perhaps you had a difficult time throughout your life forgiving a parent for their poor, poor child rearing skills. You felt abandoned. Now, at the adult, as the adult, you're experiencing the same frequency of abandonment from another perspective. In the current moment, you are receiving as much, much attention and support as you would hope from your boss. Your abandonment is once again triggered this time because the scenario is slightly different you're also you're able to perceive it from another perspective you are able to see your boss is not there to hold your hand so you decide to stand in your power make a few key decisions on your own and proceed forward with your project doing so allows you to see that you are capable of more than you gave yourself credit for initially and you no longer align with the belief that you were abandoned but that is that was an opportunity for you to stretch your wings. By clearing the sense of abandonment with the boss, you automatically apply the same integration to the issue with your parent. You may find when you reflect on your parent, you are no longer you no longer haul the angle or the anger or resistment, or the very least, not the same degree that you once did. 
And we'll start with the next question next week for part three, guys. And again, I, I take issue again with what I just read. You know, if you notice that there's some patterns that you're having with your boss because you felt abandoned as a child. So when your boss doesn't praise you, you feel abandoned again. Yes. So you try to spread your wings and proceed forward without his his support. Awesome. That's great. But you also need to go back to trying to heal that abandonment as a child. You can't ignore that. That has to be in this life, not from past lives in this life. Right. If you were abandoned as a child in this life, then there probably is some past life stuff that puts you in that situation now. But the point is, I was abandoned as a child. I wasn't protected as a child. Yes, there probably were past life stuff that happened to put me in that position in this life as a child. But my job as Bryce now is to heal this life. Not go back and figure out the drama of it, the story of it, of what happened to put me in that position. The point is I need to look at that position from this perspective now. All right, you guys, um, let me know your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below. Please be respectful to each other. I had to block someone last week who was so freaking triggered by the fact that I said past lives don't matter that she got actually nasty. And so um, if you do that, if you're nasty to me or to anybody else in the thread as we have these discussions, you will be blocked because that is a boundary. We do not abuse each other on this channel. We can disagree but we need to be respectful. All right, you guys, I hope you're having a wonderful day and I will talk to you soon.